Welcome back to I'm Still Here. How you doing? <laughs> I almost jumped right into a different one there. <laughs> welcome back. Yes, welcome back. Happy Wednesday. If you're listening on a Wednesday. Oh, right. Sorry. This is a Wednesday episode, so I'm assuming... That's true. I don't. I oftentimes don't listen to podcasts on the day they come out. Nope. We get a little too busy. Mm-hmm. Right? What are Wednesdays usually in your life? Nothing exciting. No, not really. Yeah. You? No, we're yeah. not usually <laughs> hanging out together on Wednesdays. <laughs> so <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. But. Uh, today we're going to talk about kind of building a life with metastatic breast cancer. So for some people that means kind of after the treatment phase and for some people it is really kind of right from the start. Um, I think when when I think about building a life it's also about kind of managing um, your treatment regimen but hopefully it is something that isn't causing you too much strife, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, immunotherapy has really changed the game in terms of metastatic breast cancer and allowing people to have a pretty good quality of life. Um, And then, you know, but then it comes with, okay, so how do how do I put this together? What does this look like? Some so many variables that yeah you know that could be in play here when you're talking about quality of life you know just from the treatment from cancer yeah well and i think the thing that's a little bit different for me is that when i found out i was stage four breast cancer it changed everything right so we really jumped into this regimen that was totally different my whole everything about i didn't have everything looked different then I, i wasn't working i was just you know, I was at home, I was trying to stay healthy, I was really sick at times, it was everything that you kind of think about in terms of like traditional cancer treatment would be. (coughs) But I think the really challenging part of having metastatic disease um, is trying to process what that really means and, and then how to put this the next days together, right? The next little bit. I would guess it's really a challenge also with family, friends, work, all of that kind of thing, because we are very much a society that's like, well, you don't look sick, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. And we also get tired really quickly of people being sick. So it's kind of like get on with it type of situation I would you know yeah somewhat yeah I I I equate it you know there's there's a lot of I think examples of this where um people tire of your issue yes you know whether it's divorce Mm -hmm. or whether it's uh something like it you know both they oh yeah they feel better and then Mm -hmm. uh what are you gonna do yeah you know (laughs) type of thing there's a which I don't think that's all bad. Okay. Even in no, this, is, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Be a patient for the rest of your life? Yeah. Well, that's not healthy. Yeah. You know, uh, even though you are a patient for the rest of your life, but yeah. you, you're you not going to act like one 365 days a year. It's, uh, yeah, it's, you do. Some people need a kick in the butt to yeah. get back. You, you did survive this treatment. Now yeah. what? Yeah. 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 So in my case, after radiation ended, um, we were kind of looking at, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. And I went on tamoxifen, which I don't know how much that's used anymore. I think it's pretty, um, I don't know. I I mean, most people have heard of it. um, But again, I started on tamoxifen and it was just a pill that I took every day. And I knew, I mean, I didn't have a lot of side effects from it. Or if I did, I wasn't paying attention to them. It wasn't debilitating for me to be on it. Um, And then I really just went about like creating this routine that would help me be kind of as strong as possible, right? So Okay, so kind of set the scene for everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sydney was how old? Sydney was about two, just turning two. Okay. 
Um, I was back to work mm-hmm. or, or working. You know, this was actually full-time. during the fall, so you were busy, mm-hmm. busy, busy with football. Um, we nothing big going home, going on with uh, a house or anything like that. No, at the time. I had I that summer. So when I the way that I when I started my job, I literally worked at the new place for one day, and I and. I, it was in a school. So over the summer, they contacted me and said, are you coming back? Which now I realized that they really couldn't do that. <laughs> but it, it turns out they did. And I, I made the decision, no, I wasn't yeah. coming back. I had um, applied for Social Security Disability early on, and I was granted that. And we had kind of made it through the waiting period. So we knew what that was going to look like in terms of um, some money coming in and we were able to just say, yep, we're going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stay at home with Sydney and work on my health and you are going to coach and teach and all of that stuff. Yep. So part of what I struggled with though, is because I was so used to like a routine, uh, you know, first from working and then from, you know, even with treatment that it was like, okay, what, what do I do now? So I did, I ended up joining a gym that was probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes from us. Um, and I I joined the gym in hopes of getting, you know, just building my strength overall and being in the best shape I could be. But it also provided a really great kind of routine to my days. Mm-hmm. So um, they had a day here there, at least part of the time. I could take Sydney with me. Sometimes, and she, you know, could be there while I worked out or whatever. Um, but that's, yeah, what I started yep. with. And um, at the time, we were probably still scanning like every three months. For sure we were, yes. And scans, I mean, I feel like when you have metastatic disease, like going into scans, there's so much anxiety. Um it's so hard to kind of do that vis- that body scan and not go, oh, I think my back hurts. Oh, that feels a little weird. It's so hard to um, to not get anxious about um, about you know that for sure. So, um, and I don't feel like I feel like at first the scans were like, oh. There's a little something, but we'll just watch it. Or there's a little, you know. There were. There there were a lot of maybes. There yeah. were a lot of, uh, and I don't know if it's just the technology wasn't as good, and there was some gray areas there. Um, but we did have quite a few what we would consider scares. Yes. Where it wasn't just, it's stable, looking good. Yeah. How you doing today? It yeah. wasn't those. It was, well, we'll just watch this one. or yeah, it's, You know, and how are you feeling? Yeah, yeah, and right. all of that kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, is there something else to go on kind yeah. of, you know, to, to do that? So what about, you know, when it comes to, you talked about exercise, um, which you were able to ramp up post-treatment. Uh, yeah. Um, now, nutrition was pretty ramped yeah. during... Yeah. Your treatment, meaning you made some pretty drastic changes to your diet. Why? And talk about that a little bit. Well, I made changes to my diet because I was trying to build the strongest immune system I could build and eliminate any fuel that cancer would have. And I, and so that for me, because my cancer was hormone driven, it was largely based on, you know, lack of hormones. So right. meat, dairy, those kind of things I was eliminating. And I was working uh, very closely with Black um, Center for Integrative Health, I believe is what they're called now, um, in Skokie, Illinois. Because I wasn't, yeah, every everybody with cancer, I feel like, um uh, is familiar with the fact that some all the people kind of come out of the woodwork and say, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should blah, 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 all of these things. And and while initially when you first start with nutrition, if your nutrition isn't 100% on point, you can really start with basic things like adding fruits and vegetables and whole grains, right, and eliminating processed food. Like that's just a better diet for everybody. Mm-hmm. But as you start getting into technicalities of things, it's I I felt 
um, it was really important to have somebody who really understood not just nutrition, but also cancer. And that's what I was able to find. You were taking specific supplements for the treatment that you were yep. currently yep, doing yep. at the time. I mean, it was very specific. It was very specific. And, it, and so uh, my nutrition was really ramped up. Um, and I think probably as I ended treatment, I started to, I don't want to say get more lax, but also kind of go, okay, this is what I'm going to keep. This is, you know. Well, that's what I, I don't remember. And that's what I was going to talk about there is when did you kind of not ramp that down? Um, because your nutrition is still good today. Uh, your diet is. Um, but when did you or why did you make that decision to, okay, I don't need to eliminate the hormones, but I need to be smart about where the food comes from to limit. Yeah, I don't know. I think some of it all just happened a little bit naturally. So we live in a very rural area and um, actually the spring of 99, I believe, which is when I was doing all my treatment, there uh, a little health food store opened up. Yeah. And that was really cool to be able to kind of go, oh, okay. Um, so I was like, I can get things from there. And of course, there's things that you miss. Like, I love sugar. I love candy. I, you know, there's things like, okay, what can I, how can I get sort of a substitution for this? And I didn't feel like it needed to be as intense about things. I knew some things were working great. The, my smoothie that I make, it has worked great for me for 25 years, right? And that's not going to go away. It doesn't mean it's an everyday thing for me, but it just means, oh, that's a really good basis to build on. And I think some of it too was like looking at um, like you and Sydney. Sydney has always loved meat, like always loved it. And I just wanted, I was like really concerned about sourcing good products for her too. Mm -hmm. So... So it just kind of became one of those things where I think as she started getting a little older and was eating what we were eating, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, I might be making, say we're eating kind of Mexican that night, whereas prior, you know, during treatment, I, I wouldn't have had any meat at all. I would have, we would have made things kind of separate, beans, whatever, and you make yours, I'll make mine yeah. kind of thing. Um, then it became like, oh, there's this really great farm right across the field from us mm -hmm. who is you know doing grass raised beef and no hormones and all those things no additional hormones yeah, right? Say, right that's the, i mean every animal has hormones but it was one of those things it was like okay i maybe i am okay with adding this in sometimes and you know knowing that, that the quality is there mm -hmm. so i think those are just kind of kind of what happened, mm -hmm. you know? So what about, you know, the the mental or the meditation side of it? You were pretty pretty uh disciplined in doing the meditation and writing and those kind of things to help you on the mental side during treatment. Yeah. It's part of your daily routine. Uh when you were done with treatment, what about that? I don't think that's ever really gone away. Mm -hmm. I think again it's just one of those things where I don't it's not written into my day in the same amount of time as it was mm -hmm. in the past. I think what I was trying to do after, you know, treatment was build a life. And some of that was increasing, you know, uh, some things that I might do, having things to do, not, you know, just trying to figure out what all that looked like. But mentally, um, I feel like, I know where to go or how to do it. Um, I learned really early on that like going for a walk or, you know, sometimes it was a run back in the day. It's generally not anymore. But doing that will help me go through so many thoughts, right? And there's been so many times over the years where I have gotten home or back and I just like, have a journal and just whoop, dump and that literally even happened to me last week I was on a treadmill and I just and I was actually listening to a podcast too but what was happening was just like all these thoughts you know were coming and just being able and then it was like I couldn't get to my journal fast enough to be able to just like download all of these great things to mm. me so um 
I think at that point, I really started thinking about what I was watching, listening, consuming type of thing. Um, and I love Bravo TV. I'll watch it. Like, but I've realized that I'm not going to put stuff into my head that I can't, that it, that it's too hard for me to process in terms of, I don't watch medical shows. We were mm -hmm. talking about this recently. Like yeah. when you live Because we watched them before. Cancer. We used to we watch them. ER yeah, and, yeah, we would watch, I mean, I've never watched Grey's Anatomy. I've, you know, um, I don't watch like crime stuff. You know, I just don't, I don't have a lot of capacity for things that are hard. I feel like breast cancer is hard. And yeah. I had a lot to process that. And I want to, the things I want to think about are like, how can I continue to grow and get better and um, be helpful and, you know, mm -hmm. and a little blow deck. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, the, the social side, I mean, that kind of shut down too yeah. during treatment. Mm -hmm. Um had to be really careful because your immune system was jacked. Uh, and I don't really remember after that either. I think I, I really know. a lot of my social stuff after, right after, was with a, a group of women that are all, I don't know how much older than me, but mm -hmm. they were a part of the church that we were going to. And um, I would like go to lunch with them and... Oh, I do remember that. That yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and I guess I got involved. I, I remember, like, I guess at that time I got it just involved in church. I got involved in our youth group and things like that. Uh, I, none of them were, like, really tight friend connections, you know, I wouldn't say. I mean, my friendship with Christy was as strong as ever through the cancer and beyond that. Um but I did, you know, when you're not working, you just don't have as many people to connect yeah. with, especially in a rural area, you know. And how long after that did you go back to work? Um, it was quite a while after. I think I started working again uh, probably around 2006 or seven. So it had been, I mean, quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And even that was just like... Uh, working in nursing homes, so like picking hours oh, and things okay. like that. I went back back in 2010. Gotcha. So, yeah. But, you know, you just kind of build this life of um, trying to not let the cancer control you <laughs> and trying <laughs> to live a life of purpose Um and, and stay in the moment and kind of all of those things. It's this weird, you know, mm -hmm. it's this weird mix of it all. So, you know, going back to like the medicine side of things, I was on tamoxifen for about, I think about a year and a half. And one of those scans showed a little bit more like progression or something that my doctor wasn't comfortable with. And so we switched to a different medicine, oral medicine called Arimidex. And, um, I was on that for a couple of years too. Again, super easy in terms of, you know, um, just tolerating it or whatever. And I, w I should say it was on Zometa that whole time too. Zometa is the bone strengthener. So I would go to the hospital and get that mm -hmm. every so often. Um, and then in 2004, we had another progression I feel like it was always in my spine um, or ribs. And um, I switched then to Fosladex, which is also called Fulvestrant. Um, and it was new at the time. Like it was really a new drug. Um, and that's an injection. So I started that. When I started it, it actually was one shot. It was an injection. And every four weeks. And... Um, I was on it for, I don't know how long before, like, they decided that the recommended dosage was twice that, two shots. Um, and I, I still am on Fosladex today. So I've been stable on, you know, stable with the disease since 2004. Just Fosladex, you're on? Yep. You're getting that? Okay. Yep. All right. So, 
Um, and the interesting thing about that too is that uh, I think it's been just over a year, maybe two years. I don't know now that I've back on one, just one shot of Fosidex. So um, I do not complain about things, but it, when you get two injections every four weeks for as many years as I had, I just have a lot of scar tissue built up and it was getting to be like somewhat painful <laughs> to get those shots. And so uh, we have the dose and it's been wonderful. And honestly, knowing that I started out on that and was stable on it for a long time, just made me feel fine about it. So it's not, it wasn't a big mental mm -hmm. stretch for me to feel like this isn't going to do it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I think it's really important whenever you're changing medicines and, and, well, and, and dosages. You know, to, I don't remember which, but within the last couple of years, we talked to Dr. Mariver and, and the option was there to, to stop, to stop it. Yeah. And both of you decided, no, Let's let's keep going. Yeah, and I think it made both of you comfortable. Yeah, with that decision, but um, there's there's not really in in your uh, medical uh, situation today. There's not really a pressing reason to do anything, which is unusual for a metastatic. Right. You know, and uh, it, it's it's unusual at the University of Michigan that you know yeah. you're you're kind of that that outlier. Um, and they don't really know how to handle you right. because there's years now of um, science and, and genetics and all of these things behind a lot of these patients. And there's just not there for you. Right. You are kind of one of the, the outliers there. So um, there is some consensus on, on what you do 25 years out compared to five years out, what, what you are going to do. Yeah, I think, you know, again, there's it's you know, the fact that I'm still here is, I, I understand it's a bit unusual. I hope that it becomes less unusual for people. I think it will be. And, um, but yes, and it's one of those things that there is a little bit of, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. In, in you know, I live a really full life. Mm -hmm. I, um, the side effects that I have are not from Fosletex. <laughs> You know, and so it's very tolerable. And literally, I can walk into our local cancer center. I can be in and out of there in five minutes, you mm -hmm. know. And I'm not the person who cares that my urine is going to stink for the next day or two or whatever, you know. Um, I, I just, I don't get hung up on those things. And... I mean, there's nothing different about a medicine day for me than there is about any other day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think one of the areas that uh, we've given the most kind of attention to is the sexual area. You do have side effects of treatment, of surgeries, of yeah. that, that have... Uh, Compared to treatment and to love, I think the learning of a new body has has yeah. pressed you a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, okay, it's just, I was put in menopause when I was 26. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm 51 now, and like my friends <laughs> are talking about menopause, and I'm like, yeah. I don't even remember going into it at this point, honestly. Yeah. You know what I mean? There so, was a lot going on. Yeah. So you, the from that standpoint, there it has been. I wish I could remember what my I'm. Maybe I'm. Maybe it's good that I can't. But I don't remember a body that was really different than that functioned as it should from a sexual standpoint. I don't. Rem, I mean, like intimacy was different when I had breath. Yes, all of these things, like there's been so many, I feel like challenges put in the way of that, but it's never, um, but it's always been something that we've continued to work on, right? Yep. And, um, but yeah, I think it's kind of the heart of metastatic breast cancer is when people see you and you look like anybody else, they just assume you are. And 
I'm not yeah. from so many ways, yeah. right? So many different things. And I'm not here to shout that from the rooftop, but I also, I've, I just, I've had a really different path. I've had to learn really different things. I've, you know, and even, even like, like professionally, I, I don't remember the last time, well, I guess I worked full time a little bit over at different times, but I don't generally work full time because I, it's just so important to me to be able to give myself the time to take care of myself, mm -hmm. you know, and that just doesn't, for me, for me, didn't coincide with working full time, you know. Well, it's impossible. So I mean, just just take the, the medicine that you get, you know, you, you don't get that many days off to do that you right. know, during the year. Right. So, I mean, just there have there have been a lot of um, challenges. Uh, we'll definitely talk more about intimacy. We, we talked a, a little bit about it um, in season one. And, you know, I continue to learn. I've learned more in the last couple of years about my body and it's actually functioning better than it ever has been been except prior to probably cancer i'm sure right. <laughs> back when that was just like oh sex yay you know mm -hmm. um but but yeah it's i i have learned to say like never say never kind of thing right i um uh that sometimes things that you're not focused on for a while or or things that you think might not be possible are so Right. You know. So, are you, uh, how often in a week or a month or whatever, are, are you dealing with cancer? <laughs> you know, um, that's new normal type of yeah. thing. I think now I'm, when I'm dealing with cancer, I'm dealing with it mostly from a, how can I help somebody mm -hmm. or from the podcast angle or that kind of type of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's less, I'm, I'm probably right now more into kind of the maintenance of a 51 year old than I ever mm. have been. Like literally I was thinking, oh no, I really do need to get a colonoscopy, which of course I've had one early because right. you know, of cancer things, but I, I really am probably as um, kind of a, far away from that as I have been in a long time. Mm -hmm. Some of it though is because I also have been working quite a bit on like my physical health, and that has made my side effects like my cardiomyopathy um, better. Like it's sure. just made it easier to tolerate yep. that kind of stuff. So. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to think about that in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. management of that. And even just, you know, it's a new year. And so now you're like deductibles start over and all those kind of things. I mean, I literally used to blow our deductible within like the first week. Mm -hmm. And we're just not there right now. And it's crazy to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's kind of. So a new normal is doable. It is. It's hard. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, it's changes often in figuring out things that other people don't have to. Yeah. But a new normal is doable for people. Well, and not only that, I think, you know, I think there is kind of, if you view it that way, that it, it is a great thing to consider yourself, <laughs> to take care of yourself. Like it is to know that already, that we need to take care of ourselves when you're diagnosed younger, you know, like that's a lesson you learn that you wouldn't normally learn in your 20s or 30s right no um and just to have that perspective to, in terms of you know valuing the days that you feel good and all of that kind of stuff it's all it is all a result of having cancer yeah you know so um i you know i <laughs> we've talked a little bit about like i'll never call it a gift but I know that the way we handled it and the way we've been able to live as a result of it have, you know, good has come from bad, right? No doubt. So. Yeah. The post-treatment world is just, I think what it is, is just kind of 
living, walking that balance between um, staying in, <laughs> like kind of knowing what's going on, but not giving it all of your time, right? Or whatever that, that is looks a balance. Like. Yeah, it is a you're balance right. between that. And also not just shutting it away. I don't ever shut away cancer. Like it doesn't, it's just not possible. But, mm -hmm. but it doesn't scare me in the same way. Well, it's much more in the forefront with us doing this podcast. Sure. You know, we went years and years and years where it was just, okay, it's been this. And we talk, and then we wouldn't talk about it for a long time. Well, we're almost daily talking yeah. about it now because of this. All right. So that'll do it. Until next time. <laughs> I'm still here.